guys, thanks for joining us for another installment of Verse Chorus Noise. On this episode, we're going to have a conversation with Grammy-winning engineer Ken Kyle. We're going to discuss the Grammy-winning album Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you like these shows. And if you want to see a full unedited version of this show, hit our Patreon link below. Thanks and enjoy. Mike Galaxy here with Verse Chorus Noise. On this installment, we take a spin with Fleetwood Mac's best-selling album, Rumors. Rumors was the band's 11th studio release, second release with Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham, and immediately followed the success of their eponymous album, also known as The White Album. Rumors topped the Billboard charts for 31 consecutive weeks and won the Album of the Year Grammy, largely due to the success of its top 10 singles, Go Your Own Way, Don't Stop, You Make Love and Fun, and the hit Dreams, which reached the number one spot. Rumors has gone on to sell over 40 million copies worldwide, and in 2020, Rolling Stone named Rumors the seventh greatest album of all time. Rumors was primarily recorded at the record plant in Sausalito, California throughout much of 1976 and produced by Richard Dashute and Ken Kyle, who had just finished Warren Zevon's self-titled album. Ken also penned the best-selling book, Making Rumors, the inside story of the classic Fleetwood Mac album. Here is Ken Kyle. So I first met Fleetwood Mac. Um, they were uh, had just finished a uh, live recording of the King Biscuit Flower Hour of their, I guess, the latest album. They called me in to have me mix the show for them. And uh, I, I had grabbed the uh, copy of the, their previous album, the White Album, which had the picture of the band on the back. And under on the back of it, it said Stevie and Lindsay, but the names weren't in the right order. It list, listed the band members. But so when the band walked in, I saw Stevie and I walked up to her and I put my hand out and I said, hey, Lindsay, I'm a big fan. So nice to see you. So she looked at me and kind of like smiled like, oh, I'm Stevie. Excuse me. Well, we had we had a really good time. I was under no pressure at all. Uh, I remember Richard Dash had, who was, well, had worked with the band. The band actually lived at his house part-time. I came in and I I looked over at him. He was a very friendly guy. And I said, hey, you want to smoke a joint? And so we lit up and and we were instant friends and the music was great. And uh, I started mixing and uh, Stevie was dancing. I remember remember we were doing, I was mixing uh, Rihanna and uh, she was dancing around. She says, Ken, sounds so good. Can you put some more fairy dust in my vocal? And I turn some knob and you know she was fine with that so uh they they said we're just doing this new album we, we like you so much ken you're so much fun to work with unfortunately we're doing a uh we're doing a test recording for another engineer uh to record our upcoming ab- album in sausalito and we sure wish we didn't have to do it but we're going with him it's on sunday and uh i, I got a call sunday night from, and they said uh uh, Ken, the, the the session went horribly. Everything didn't, nothing worked, and we want you to do it. So they said, "Can you redo our a, a single mix for Rihanna?" So I said, "Sure, come into the studio Monday, and I'll I'll we'll, we'll mix the single." Back then, you had to mix a special mix for the single because they couldn't use a stereo version because it might not fold down properly. So they came in on Monday, and uh, and uh, we mixed the uh, album. And again, it was like I just had done this two days before, so. It was no big sweat for me. So anyway, they came in the next day. I mixed the show for them, and everybody was loving it. And uh, Stevie's twirling and everything. So I got a call, I think, the next day, and they said, uh, we're going to do our album in Sausalito. Would you like to come with us? Well, and I said, absolutely. I'm going to bring my dog, though. I said, sure, whatever. So it was like a couple of weeks later before I went up there and uh, started the record. I knew how much the effects played a part in the record. So what I said, what I wanted to do is I tried to, I tried to make, I always had my headphones mixes in stereo. Uh, back to then, they, they weren't always stereo. Sometimes they were mono because it was cheaper. But I said, no, I want stereo headphones. And so then I gave stereo effects to the, to the uh, instruments and to the artists. So to me, they could hear exactly what it was going to sound like uh, later. And I don't know why, but I just saying it, it sounds like, huh, pretty smart. You know, so it, it forced me to make the, make it sound like 
what I thought the record was going to be like if if we did it right then and there. So I I was a pretty good engineer at that point. I was very good. I had done a lot of live recordings, Paul McCartney, uh, uh, Pink Floyd, Procol Harum. And so I and I knew all my microphones and what they were good at and what they were setting, what the settings should be. So I walked in and I and I said, OK, let's set up mixed drums the way. Uh, and here's the mics I'm, I'm going to use. And I, and I put everything the way I would normally do it. And Mick came in and, and hit the drum. And it was just like it was made out of marshmallow. It was like bonk. I said, what the hell is this? Bonk, bonk. And matter what I did, I couldn't make the the drums sound gigantic, and they sounded gigantic inside there. So this led to three or four days of of panic in the studio, and me and Richard Dasher were beside ourselves. We couldn't figure out what's wrong, and realizing that it, we were going to get fired if we didn't do something soon. Uh, Mick even contributed uh, to the effort by being there all the time. And we actually ended up putting two kick drums together, taped them together, trying to make it sound big. And we couldn't do anything. Finally, I realized, I just said, fuck it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm too myopic on this, probably smoking pot. And I said, you know, let's, I just said, everybody pl get on, let's play the song down. And let's just forget about this. We're going to make it happen. So they started playing and I started twisting all the EQ and all them on all the mics and uh, and it came together in like five minutes. It, it, it actually did sound good. I'm looking back at it now. We were just listening to solo instruments rather than instruments with another, uh, you know, a bass, a keyboard, a, a vocal and, and uh, guitars in it. So it was, it turned out the Sauce Leader Studio was a, was a Tom Hidley design which was typical of record plant at that time. Uh, really, everything was heavily compressed. The ceilings were, were compressed and it contained all the sound and, and uh, the room was really dead. I remember I, I set up mixed drums out in this control room and it was carpeted. And so in the rooms, were, it was so dead. I had to, I told the, the road crew to go buy some uh, uh, eight by 10 sheets of uh, plywood. And so we set the mixed drums up on the plywood so we wouldn't have the carpet interfering and we would make the whole drum kit open up more. And still, to my surprise, when I mic'd that way, it didn't help. Which I could go back to that day again and knowing what I know now, see how, how, how bad was it? Was it just weird speakers? Because obviously it was okay because when I, the whole band played, it sounded great. So Keep Me There was the first song. It actually turned out we could never use it, um, but there was a amazing uh, a bass uh, break in the middle of it and a guitar solo right afterwards. It went boom, ba ba boom, ba ba boom, ba ba boom. So that was a part of Keep Me There. But the first part of Keep Me There was crap. But and, and the choruses were funky. Later, we made it into the chain. And the White Album didn't go number one until like eight, uh, eight months in, like it went in, I think it went in August of 76, it went number one. And we were, we started in January of 76. So when the album's climbing the charts, the, the label was doing backflips. They couldn't be happy with what we were doing. They didn't care how much studio time we were using. They were just thrilled. So we were protected. We just had freedom. And, and as the record sold really big, the the latitude for, what's the budget going to be uh, for the record company became uh, irrelevant. As the White Album started uh, uh, doing really well, uh, the band started reacting to it and they could see uh, their, the, the fruits of their labor uh, and how they would, it would turn out if they could proceed. So that one day, and we started the record in January, 76 in February, I believe the, the, uh, Rhiannon was starting to get radio airplay and starting to get uh, be be a success. And uh, Stevie runs into the studio and she says, I just talked to my attorney guys. And he says, the White Album is going to be success. He said, listen, if we can make this record as good as it, it's all we have to do. 
we will be superstars. And she says, I'll never have to be a cleaning lady again. We'll never have to work again. We'll have a success. So I said, well, let's do it. Let's go for a Grammy, I said. I toasted a Grammy. I think Lindsay was, uh, he was the more nervous one. My part in there, I was the, I was hired as an engineer, not a producer. And, and I loved, the thing I did best is make instruments sound the best they could ever be. And because uh, I would put effects on guitars and they would, they would have this mystery or swirling uh, sound around it, attached to it. And he loved that. So he would... It would be like a hairdresser, you know, making somebody look amazing. So I made his guitar sound so good. So he just said, you know, I was I was his buddy then. So the, so the personal favorite of my mine from Rumors uh, was probably um, um, Silver Springs, which didn't really make it on, on the record because it became the B side of the first single of Go Your Own Way. But Silver Strings was, was this really great ballad and it didn't make it on the record because there were too many like that and we just didn't have, couldn't afford to, to squeeze it on a record that back then vinyl only could hold 22 minutes on, on a side without losing volume. Yeah, yeah, and we didn't have any choice and the math supported it. I told her, I said, Stevie, the only way it's... Uh, she said, oh, Ken, we can't get rid of that. I gave it to my mother. It's about my mother. I gave her a, a percentage of it. And I said, well, I said, the only thing we can do, Stevie, is take one of your other songs off because you have more time than on the record than anybody else. And she went, oh, she realized right then the math on it. She said, that's fine. We can take it off. So we agreed to, to we compromise and put it on the B side of the first 45 single, which was like throwing in a trash can. Stevie said, well, I got this song called, uh, me and Lindsay, an old song of ours uh, called I Don't Want to Know. I said, okay, let's cut it. So we set up, we were out of sauce leader now. We were in uh, Hyders in LA. And uh, we set up and we tracked it and got the thing finished in one night. During the recording process, I did not hear a hit at all. I mean, I was so thrown off by everything that was going on. Um, and we were so close to it that uh, I didn't know what. I mean, Go Your Own Way, which was a big song. I think I knew Dreams was going to be. I knew it could be. Go Your Own Way was really amazing. But the first day Lindsay played Go Your Own Way, he, he was playing it on acoustic guitar and he was beating the shit out of the acoustic guitar and s singing so hard, his vocal, his but uh, veins were popping out. He's like, you can go your own way. And it's like, well, that's unpleasant at best. And then to make it worse, my, uh, it was at Christmas, we had finished mixing and I invited a friend of mine over to hear the final mixes. And he came up, everybody was outside smoking. And uh, he, come, he came up and said, guys, I don't know how to tell you, but I didn't hear one hit on there. And, and we were so tired and we're so so close to the whole thing that all of us just went, really? It's like it confirmed our, our worries, you know. But, you know, I remember playing, we played it for the first time to the record company and they went crazy. I mean, it was amazing. They didn't say anything for like 20 seconds. And I thought, oh, God. Nick said, go ahead and play another song, Ken. Hurry. I think we played Go Your Own Way and then Dreams and, and they went nuts. I'm to say someone has taken my place. Oh, yeah. Uh, secondhand News was, uh, yeah, that, that was called The Strummer. Uh, everything had a nickname before we had uh, lyrics. So, and it was about him strumming. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, I, I didn't think much of the song. It was okay. But it was just and very fast paced. And uh, but with Lindsay, the 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 beauty of the song comes out in the you know types of frosting he puts on it. You know, and and he could just do some amazing things. We worked on that song into the summer after we left Sausalito. We we were there four months, and then we went back to my home studio, Wally Hyder Studio Four, and we worked 
I think about another four months, two months just with Lindsay and Richard and I in the studio. So Lindsay was just painting uh, you know, musical colors. And so he would say, okay, I want to capo this this guitar up and I'm going to just do these accents. Shing, ching, 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 you know, and, but, and they're beautiful. And, and they would just be out there. We put some reverb on them and, or he'd do a half speed piano thing that would just be, he would play it slow speed when, when it would ding, 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 ding. And it would just be up there in the, in the top of the, of the, of the musical spectrum. He finally came to the, to the uh, point to admit that he hated John's bass on the strummer. And so finally he said, because we're just all a bunch of guys in there. The girls had gone on vacation to Hawaii and Mick had gone on vacation. So we just had me and Lindsay and Richard and then Chris Morris, the second engineer in the studio. And finally, Lindsay just burst out. I said, he says, I want to, I want to re-record John's bass. And I went, uh, uh, John's not here. You probably don't want to do that now. And he said, no, let's just do it. So John's bass bar on, on Strummer was bum, 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 moving all over the spectrum. And Lindsay needed it to be more, more in staying in one area. So Lindsay played the part. It was more or less pedaling it. Boom, 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 boom. Just staying right down this freeway. Left a lot of space for other things, for like that acoustic guitar. I told you we could capo it up and did. And so uh, when uh, we kept that part, and I, I, I thought John's bass part was brilliant. And it was. It's a brilliant part. Love that part. But it didn't fit with Lindsay's plans for, for the song and what he wanted to do with it. John B came back from vacation. We were playing the, the, the song for him. And Chris Morris, who's kind of a cocky, dry-witted guy, said, hey, Ken, why don't you play John the new bass line? And, of course, John was already two sheets to the wind anyhow by this point. But he goes, what? What did you do? You, Oh, yeah, Lindsay uh, re-recorded your bass. So we played the new bass line, and Lindsay threw in some lines. So John was shocked. But... I think we played it with the other guitars and, and I think John was okay with it, but John was a little bit upset. And Mick said, uh, Mick said, you know, good for you, Johnny, you're taking it like a man. And I remember Lindsay said, well, Mick, that's good. I'm glad you feel that way. Cause I've got some changes for you, but your drum parts. <laughs> so uh, John, uh, Lindsay uh, had also replaced Mick's uh, drums with his own Tom Bills in second hand news. So Stevie, while we were working on other songs, Stevie gets bored because she doesn't play an instrument. So she doesn't have much to say about things other than what harmonies she might add in. And we weren't even at the vocal stage. So she would just get bored. And she apparently had talked to uh, um, the studio management and they and, and arranged to have a quiet place for her to uh, write songs in. And it was Sly Stone's uh, uh, personal studio there. So she had gone back and uh, wrote this song. And she burst in after writing it to the control room. And she goes, guys, guys, I just wrote the best song I've ever written. And we had just finished our song. So she we said, let's hear it. And she sat down at the keyboard inside the studio, inside the control room with us. She started playing and this little three-chord riff. and. Uh, and uh, that was the birth of dreams. So Mick, uh, I think I remember Mick was beating on the couch or whatever to make some percussion sounds. Uh, eventually, John would be had the roadie bring in his bass, his acoustic bass, and so he started playing some bass lines along with it. Lindsay, of course, had grabbed his acoustic guitar. <laughs> it was just so amazing. We set up; we were already set up to record. Uh, every 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 day and every song so we went out and cut the basic track for for dreams that that afternoon
Never, never going back again is an interesting story. Originally, it was supposed to be Mick playing uh, brushes. So the song was called Brushes. He had this really intricate uh, guitar part uh, where a lot of picking going on. And uh, I said, Lindsay, you know, that guitar sounds really good. Um, when you're picking it, you're doing. I said, would you let me do an experiment? I said, I love an acoustic guitar. I played acoustic guitar and I, I know that I loved how acoustic guitars sound when they have brand new strings on them. Um, so I said, let's put new strings on every, as soon as they're, they're not as good as they used to be. He started getting more inspired by what he was playing. And so we started, he started adding second parts and third parts to the whole thing. The interesting thing about it, like after we recorded the whole thing, I kept saying to him, can you just, can I hear a vocal? Can you just sing a rough vocal? Because I, I have no idea where the verse ends. You know, I have a rough idea, but I'd love to hear the vocal to, to know where everything goes and, and how, it, how it all goes together. And he kept saying, no, no, I just want to do this one part, one more part, one more part. Well, finally, at the end of the night, we were done with this masterpiece. It was layered guitars, harmonics, uh, Nashville tuning, all this amazing stuff. And so he wanted to do it the next morning. The next morning we came back and he said, OK, he's, he's going to sing. And he goes to, to sing the song. He goes, wait, he says, the song's in the wrong key. I said, what? So the song's in the wrong key. And I said, well, let's see if we can pitch shift it or see if we can get it in the, in the right key. Well, it was so far off the key he needed to sing it in that we had to re-record everything. So it turns out he decides, okay, let's forget about that changing the strings thing. Let's put new strings on. And he just combined all his parts and the best parts of each take into one take. And I think we did two takes and we were done with it in two hours. You know, I don't have many memories about Don't Stop. I just know that it was, it was a song that uh, Lindsay and Christine had decided they really wanted to sing together. I, th I think that was from You Can Go Your Own Way. Uh, stem from that, they liked their voices, how they sang together. You can go your own way. Go your own way. Go your own way was it, it started out really weird uh, with, with him beating his, his acoustic guitar to death and screaming on his vocal, um, it built slowly. It was a, it was a funny thing. He, we went to, on the second day we recorded, first day we started with acoustic guitar, and then he decided to uh, move up, move on to replace the acoustic guitars with electric guitars. And I think he was using a uh, Les Paul. So that, and what we would start to do on, on all our recordings, we would, we would lay down a basic track where Mick would put down some basic drums, John would put, basic bass part and then christine would put her either a piano or a or a, a b3 a hammond on there so when lindsay filled in with the with the les paul and then we doubled it and then it started to the song started to have some some structure going on away didn't really take shape till lindsay decided that he decided that there was there was no definition to the, to where one was in the song so he said, Ken, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add acoustic guitar. So, so he added this, and I think he capoed the, the song up. We put it in, in reverb, and uh, he added that guitar and doubled it and tripled it and all those things. So that was, to me, that's what, when it really started to, to have some cohesive change. And then we knew when to put backgrounds in and to, you know, his whole guitar solo. And the guitar solo was was a, a, a pretty interesting story too. Uh, there is no actual guitar solo on tape, one guitar solo. So when he was working on the guitar solo for Go Your Own Way, uh, we were working on guitar ideas. And as it just turned out that he would do uh, and one idea and, and then I would like, okay, let's, let's build off of that and let's, punch in on, on another track and I would play the other track and then he would take off. And from there, he would start playing uh, that. Maybe that was the, you know, the four bars. And then it was, he would add another guitar for four bars. 
So when it was all done, I had to play the the guitar solo. Uh, and I remember we were mixing over Christmas and I got snowed in. I was visiting my parents and I got snowed in. Uh, I couldn't get home in time and they were working late. I got home finally and they, they called me at like midnight and they said, you got to come down here. We can't figure out the solo. So I, I got in the studio and I played the solo and slide this later. And I think it was six different tracks that, that built up the solo up. And I literally, I had to, I was like playing the console like a guitar. I would slide up with a room and these, these, all these moves. And, and I remember Lindsay grabbed me and says, you're, wait, you're, you're worth your weight in gold. And the song Songbird, I mean, that's that's a beautiful song, you know. She was, we were finishing up in the studio and we finished up some other song and I was out there rapping chords and Christine's playing on the grand piano this song. I, I stopped, listen, and I listened, I said, she's that's beautiful. So I, I went over and I sat down on the piano bench with her. It was just so beautiful and so welcome me and she kind of looked at me like what the fuck are you doing sitting on my piano bench Kelly? you know so then i thought well i probably could be doing something better with my time the piano was mic'd up everything all the mics were in the into the control room there was a tape machine in there and i walked in and hit record on the machine um, just so we have something to document it so Played it back for her, and and uh, it was really dry. You know, it was just a dry piano in a room. And I remember I added some reverb. I was trying to get some depth to it, and I couldn't get the right kind of depth to it. I had uh, the last project I had done before Rumors was Joni Mitchell's live album, and where there was a lot of piano and a lot of ambience. Most of the ambience was in a in a theater in an amphitheater with the piano being pumped out to the pumped out to the hall. And so that's what the kind of ambience I was trying to add to Christine's piano that I couldn't. I was just using regular reverb. But I said, so we played it, we played everything that day, uh, the next day to uh, the band. And I said, I said, you know, I just can't get the reverb. I want to get on this. I said, we should do this at Zellerback Auditorium, which is where I had recorded um, Joni Mitchell, the Joni Mitchell. And they said, okay. So what do you mean? Okay, okay, do it. So I had to get on the phone and arrange to get a hold of Zellerback Auditorium and rent it and get a mobile truck out there, a bunch of really great microphones to, uh, to collect the ambience. And I, I had their Steinway Grand Piano Concert Grand, and their and the acoustic sh uh, shell they used to push sound out to the audience, and rather than let it go in the back, and uh, so I we set it up for a couple days from then, and I had them I had them put um, a bunch of roses on the piano, and they put three different colored lights to, facing down on the uh, on the roses on the piano and uh we went to record this songbird and uh i remember christine said my god it looks so beautiful here she had this we we showed up i think at six o'clock at night she had we had the, she had the hall all to herself so she was the only thing in there making noise uh, which i realized after realized at that point that the piano wasn't loud enough to make the hall do anything to, to give you that kind of excitement. So fortunately I was lucky enough, my guys had brought all the stuff they needed. And I said, can we get some speakers out there to blow the, the piano sound out in the hall? And we had really some expensive microphones out in the hall to use their the hall's great acoustics to make it sound good. So, uh, so we recorded the piano, and um, I'm, I guess I'm delving into this because it's such an important part of the, the song. 
and uh, we recorded the piano with the ambience using uh, um, microphones. And then we had to do the same thing with a vocal, I found out. Listen to the wind blow, watch the sun. So the chain was originally called Keep Me There. The best thing John did on, on the chain was the original bass line to the song Keep Me There, especially as it went to the vamp after the break. And then his bass line was boom, 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 boom. Right, so that's the big drama tension setting uh, part of the song. And then Lindsay explodes out of that into a solo. So the ba that bass line and that solo to the end of the song were the original of Keep Me There. It's the only reason we kept Keep Me There for 11 months while we worked on it. We kept going back to Keep Me There and we're like, what are we gonna do in this? But we didn't wanna lose that the break in the bass line and the guitar solo. Um, so, Finally, and we were had moved to this producer's workshop where we were mixing the the record, and we were down to the final hours now. And Lindsay walks into the studio and says, "I got it. I think I know how to fix. Uh, keep me there." So uh, I said, "Great." He said, "Okay, take the tape, and I want you to replace the verses with blank tape." Okay, well, that's not that easy to do, but we could do it. So we we cut out the the, the, ver the verses of the song and we replaced them with blank tapes. So, so there was X number of bars that were there before of blank tape. So that so then he said, okay, okay, now we had to create a count a count in, and he went and he said, Mick, play, I want you to play a kick drum. You know, and he had this. And then against that, he we were gonna he wanted to add an instrument. Uh, it was some guitar, some guitar uh, like instrument. And so we decided a dobro was gonna be. We try we we have these arsenal of guitars. So we decided a dobro would be the best sound. So we cut that in the whole song. So then we had this chorus that was not really a very good chorus of keep me there, still existing, uh, but that was that it turned out to be perfect for the chain. We just erased the vocals that were there. And I think we kept the organ and the, I, to me, it was genius how he, you know, he saw it all in his head. I, I saw it all unfolding. So I guess you make love and fun. Uh, it was one of the uh, early songs that we recorded. Um, and it was, a, it was the first time that I saw there was a uh, descent in the, in the ranks of the group. Uh, so we were recording, uh, we, we recorded the basic track and uh, You Make Love and Fun was, I, I love the track. It was just Mick did the hi-hat and then, and then slap with the snare and then, then Christine on the keyboard. So anyway, so then we get these, this track down and Chris Morris, our second engineer was kind of a, disco guy and he said you know do something like sly stone would do with a with a with a clav and some, you know so we replaced the original soft um uh fender Rhodes keyboard that chris was playing with this clav and uh i think we borrowed it from sly, uh, sly's room or something and uh but we wanted it to wah wah and Chris said, I can't wah-wah while I'm, make it wah-wah while I'm playing. I, and so Nick, Nick said, well, and she said, and she said, you know, it's got a wah-wah in time with the music. Nick said, well, I'm the timekeeper. I'll do it. So we hooked up a, a wah-wah pedal to Christine's cloud and uh, set it up on a table. So it was high enough for the six foot five frame of Nick to play comfortably. So he, he said, you know, did a couple of lines of coke and he was just ready for, he was all fluid. And so she played the part and he was pushing on the wah-wah pedal. He was playing the pedal. So he did it through the whole, the one take all the way through. And she got, we got that wah-wah part and that was amazing. So that's kind of like, you don't see that very often. Then uh, there was a point when we were adding some background vocals and uh, Stevie and Lindsay were sitting out in the studio and Stevie 
and they're singing something like, you know, you make love and fun, you make love and fun. And then da da da, and they repeat it. And and they somebody made a mistake. They stopped. I stopped tape. The speakers were blaring. They're not blaring anymore. And all of a sudden, I hear "fuck you, asshole, go to hell," and coming out of my speakers and coming out of the going into the, my microphones that I've got going on. And it's Stevie and Lindsay's going at each with each other. And it's like, uh-oh, they're having a fight. And I'm hitting rewind as fast as I can. Let's get back to the, to to retake, do the take. So and I and I finally got back to the part and I said, okay, you guys ready? Here we go. Take two. And they go, yep. And I hit the thing and they turn right right, right around the mic and right on cue. You make love and fun. Da, da, da. And then I stopped again and it was like, fuck you, you know, and they continued the argument. And uh which is when I realized that that two of our members were were breaking up. Uh, right around the same time, uh, I turned around and Christine and John's girlfriend, Sandra, uh, John said something stupid and both girls threw their glass of shame <laughs> in his face. And I had just turned around just to see the Sam Bain flying and... Uh, so I suddenly realized, okay, four of the members of my five member group are are having trouble. So the rest of the, the project, I had to kind of say, see and see who was not who was not having fight and fighting uh, episodes, and then I would focus on them doing their parts. And then Mick got a call later on one of those days that, that his wife was leaving him for. Uh, his best friend, Jeremy Spencer. And so Mick was just, he looked like somebody had just punched him repeatedly in the, in the stomach. He was just, but so the important thing of that ties back into the, what I said when Stevie came in, uh, when she got off the call with her attorney and, um, and she said, you know, we, our attorney says, if we do this album, right, we'll be superstars. We'll never have to work again. And I don't want to have to be a cleaning lady uh, anymore. And she says, can we just put the fucking fighting down and let's make the, we all, we all know we're breaking up. Can we just try to make this record? She convinced the group to forget about the fighting. Let's not break up the band. Let's finish this record. And everybody did. Oh, daddy, you soothe me with your smile. What can you say about Oh Daddy? I mean, Oh Daddy's pretty, pretty straight ahead, and um, and the only thing I can remember about it is that uh, it started with a nice organ part, and uh, we were having some trouble with one of our tape machines that day. Somehow, the uh, one of the pieces of equipment fell off the shelf and landed on the power cord for the tape machine while I was rewinding the tape. So the, the power cord got knocked out of the wall. The tapes just went into freewheel. I reached over and grabbed one of them and tried to stop the other one. Um, and it snapped the tape of Oh Daddy right in the beginning. And, and so I put it back together and uh, I spliced that. I tore out the mangled tape and uh, put it back together. And, um, and I played it and it just went... It just went, G -d 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 -d, uh, Addy, just the word A-D-D-Y. So it was always called Addy after that. You know, eventually we replaced the beginning uh, uh, organ part, and then she put a new vocal on. Well, did she make you cry, make you break down, shatter your illusions of love? Oh, Goldust Woman, wow. So that was one of the reasons why Silver Springs didn't fit on the record. Because Gold Dust was such a long song. And I never thought much about it. I just seemed kind of like a, another Stevie talking forever. Her songs used to be at 14, 15 minutes long. She would go on and these, they would just be endless stories about her grandmother doing something. And, and it was like, good God, Stevie, nobody cares. But I never told her that. I was thinking that. So... Stevie, don't listen to this part. Anyway, uh, um, so yeah, Goldust Woman was an interesting song. It, it, 
it it uh, it provided the opportunity for us to get into some psychedelic stylings. Um, about the only thing I think really is interesting is is when we recorded the uh, end version, we were trying to she wanted to to have glass break. So we had the road crew go out and get sheets of glass and we put it in this um, room and uh, a tiled room and, and Mick was breaking the glass. Um, and so, and, and which you would think would be easy to break it, but he needed to break it on time. This was before we, we thought we'll just record it and then drop it in anywhere. So he was trying to break the hold of a pane of glass and shatter it. Didn't work very well. Eventually, nobody got cut. And eventually, we got the, the glass laid in. And then Stevie said, okay, now I'm going to go out and, and turn down the lights in the studio. I want to I want to wail. I want to wail like a, like a uh, banshee. And so she, uh, something crawling on me, but uh, so Stevie goes out in, in the studio and she got herself amply uh, uh, um, inebriated and you know, liquored up in the right direction to do to, to her performance. And she went out there and just was screaming, this howling, howling, howling. Um, amazing stuff. I probably have it here somewhere. Um, but it was amazing. She, she went out there and just, ow! And literally, I mean, this is all in the back end of the record. Um, um, so it must have been a better story about Goldust, but but I don't remember. It was just it was this ditty, you know. We you know, and we I had I had Fleetwood Mac in the studio to to make it go any direction. So I realized later on, and after I did Fleetwood Mac, that having a band like Fleetwood Mac to be able to do create any wish that you said you want to do. I want to do glass. I want to do, you know, their creativity really made it, it be a special record. The rumors took about a year to, to record. We started in January of 76. We finished in January of 77. The, the whole rumors was a work in progress. So they all, everybody would bring in their ideas and they said, let's work on this, let's work on this, which was really probably what was so collaborative about rumors. About five months into the record, we started noticing that there was a potential problem with the masters. Uh, my, my assistant engineer said, hey, Ken, I just, if you notice the heads, uh, the tape heads are collecting a lot of oxide from the tape. I said, no, it's probably nothing. And I said, just go ahead and, and uh, uh, clean, let's clean the heads every half hour and then look at them. It must have been just something, one time thing. So he did. And the next half hour, we did it again. They were just black with the oxide from the tape. So that those of you who don't, you can probably guess that the oxide is, is what we record onto and those particles contain your your music, part of your music. And our tapes had been played so many times over the past months that the uh, the tapes were wearing out. And we didn't, I think we figured they, we had 3,000 hours on the tapes because all we did is sit there and listen to those tapes all the time. So we had a, uh, we had a, a one of our techs were there and, and he said, uh, and oh, Chris Morris said, by the way, you know, we, we've we been logging these uh, safety masters uh, around ever since we, we cut the basic tracks. And this is a really interesting thing. And for me, maybe not for you, but, but um, as the, as the tapes wearing out, uh, we realize we're, we're thinking all of our work is about to, uh, you know, all fall off the tape and and be gone forever. So we went ahead and made copies of everything, and we did that regularly. But uh, so Chris Morris said, "Remember, 
Remember, remember when we started the record, uh, uh, Nina, the studio manager, offered us a great deal to on the tape and to record the uh, basic tracks uh, with both 24 tracks. So the first time, first and only time in my life have, have I ever recorded uh, the basic tracks that we're cutting double 24 track. I would never do that again. It's a waste of time because you're, you're, you're going to make so many other decisions. So uh, we had been carrying these tapes all along. They were, they were the basic tracks uh, at, at hour one. So my tech said, well, why don't we just transfer everything over to, from to everything new back onto the, to those tapes and we'll have new drums and everything. And uh, so uh, sounded good on paper, but back then there was no way to lock two tape machines together and transfer it easily. So we had to manually, like everything, we had to manually make it happen. So we went to this um, ABC Dunhill and they had this guy named Bob Bruner who said, yeah, I'll, I can do it. We put two tape machines one to play one to play the old tape and the other one to record the new parts onto the new the new old tape. So he put a snare drum, he put a, a stereo headphone on, he put one the, the snare drum from this machine and the snare drum from this machine and th this head this ear. So he would he would run this via so variable speed controller on the machine. And if they were in sync, the snare the snare sounded in the, in, your, in the center. But if they started running out of sync, they would slide this way or this way. So he had to, he learned that he had to put headphones on one way or another way, and then he could steer the, the beat with this volume control, I mean, the speed control. And it was an exhausting process. He did, he did, uh, I tried doing it for, like one song and I, I, I went insane. But uh, anyway, we transferred all of the, all of the, uh, the new information onto the old drum tracks and the clean tracks. It's basically, and we say, yeah, and we saved rumors from, from, uh, from either being a half, half of the fidelity it had. Um, because at one point I, when we were, testing that out, I, I asked, I was trying to see if I was crazy. So I said to Lindsay and the band, I said, okay, I'm going to put up two faders. One's going to be our kick drum. One's going to be our snare drum. Can you tell, tell me which is which, how hard can that be? Right. So they play it and they're both clue, clue, clue. So they both sounded like kick drums. So our snare was turning into a kick drum. So that, that's before just to show you guys how I mean how bad it was. We were starting to say, are we just listening too loud or it just seemed like the top end's going away? And that's what was happening. The oxide was basically holding most of the top end. When we finally uh, um, mixed the thing and and we were, we mixed it at this place called Producers Workshop which had transformerless console and transformerless tape machines and, and all this high tech stuff. And, and it really made the records sparkle. And uh, so we were very thrilled. Uh, I was thrilled, but again, I was so tired that my friend who listened to the playback said there were no hits. <laughs> <laughs> there was not one not hit, you know? Yeah, for sure. There were lots of hits on this album. Ken, tell us about your book, Making Rumors, the inside story of this classic Fleetwood Mac album. Uh, I started writing my book, Making Rumors, in 2011 because at the request of so many of my friends who loved having me tell them stories about the album. So, uh, and they called me up with this couple called me up. They said, if we can get you a book deal, would you do it? I said, yeah, but... Uh, I'm not going to work for it at all. So they made some calls and Harper Collins called me up and 
said, I hear you've got some stories about rumors. And uh, so I met with the guy and told him some stories. And they did a book deal with me and, uh, and it uh, took me about, I guess, three months to write it. Um, I, I, I sequestered my den and I put track sheets up everywhere. So I had the dates and, and times. And so my memories were pretty good as it turned out back then. I, um, I remembered the key things, especially of, of the fun things. My book's available anywhere. So, uh, and it's a great story. I think it's a, I, I wrote it because about what she what Stevie said, you know, I thought that was really a, people need to know how, how a big time records made by big time artists. And I think it's, it's an honor to them, you know? So, and I, I try to write it like you're in the sit, you're sitting on my, on my shoulder in the control room. And that concludes this installment of Verse Course Noise. I want to thank Ken Kyle, and I want to thank all my listeners and supporters. We'll see you next time. Mike, that was it. Was a pleasure. It was uh, a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I'm always and and still amazed that I can remember these things. I'm not senile yet. Not completely, anyhow. Hope you enjoyed this installment of Verse Chorus Noise. Thank you very much for checking it out all the way to the end. If you like this show, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget to give it a like also. If you want to see a full unedited version of this show, go to our Patreon, link below. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.